Hey, it's Susan. Come along with me as I take you through my process of painting this butterfly. All right, so before I get into explaining my process for the different parts of this video, I want to let you know that the reference photo is linked below, as well as the supplies I use, all of the colors I use, as well as a list of convenient timestamps. So if you're looking to jump to certain phases of the painting process, then you can do so using those timestamps. Everything is located below inside of the description box of this video. So of course I started with a sketch and the sketch is really a place for me to learn a little bit more about the subject that I'm going to be painting and it gives me an opportunity to observe the details and also to create what I feel like is a map or a guideline for me to use when I'm going to go back and paint. So I typically will sketch, especially when it comes to detailed subjects like this, like a butterfly, um, the veining on the wings is really detailed and I want to make sure I get that right. And it gives me a sense of security when I have those lines. So if you are the type that doesn't like to sketch, and I know there are a lot of people who don't. A lot of my members inside of my community that paint with me um, don't like to sketch before they draw and they like to just go for it and that's totally fine too. Some people really love relying on a pencil sketch. I'm one of those people and there's nothing wrong with that as well. So um, this is me just kind of sketching it out and just making sure that I have everything in place. Now one thing I do want to know is that I'm not going to sketch everything. I'm just going to sketch the things that I want to be there for me as a guide when I get to painting the details. Most of the other stuff, like the background and placement of things like that, I'm going to leave um, just completely blank, like the flower completely blank other than the um, or overall shape so that I can um, have a placeholder for the layout, like positioning of it. and. The leaves on the flower, of course, are there, and that's about it. You will see me at the tail end of the sketch do a little bit of a really light line um, up in the background area just to give myself a marker for where the white parts of the background are or the lightest parts of the background because I just wanted to know kind of placement-wise where I would be locating it. It gives me sort of a marker or just a mental note. It's barely visible. You probably won't even be able to see it, but I definitely do mark this, that, that item or those items on the sheet of paper. Now that the sketch is done, I'm moving forward and I'm going to be wetting the paper and just starting the painting process. You might be wondering where I'm going to be doing masking fluid because it would make sense to put fluid on the little dots because those would be really hard to preserve as white spots. And I'm actually planning to do that later on, so you'll see at which point I do that in this video. Um, I wanted to create, you know, not stark white spots. I wanted the spots to have a little bit of color and so if I put masking fluid right up at the beginning then it's going to preserve the white of the paper and I felt like it would look less natural. So it was just part of my process this time and I thought to myself intentionally that I would use masking fluid later on in the process. So basically all I did here was wet both sides of the paper. It is sticking itself at this point to the acrylic panel and I'm just making sure that there's an even sheen all the way across the top and that I'm soaking up any of the water that's pooled along the edges. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to do what I call the first wash or the main background wash. And the intention here is to keep everything really light and just get that first um, kind of 
wash of color. And so you can see that I decided to put in um, like a light wash of orange for the butterfly wings just at first. Um, and then I will move on to the background and do this light wash of green. And I'm actually going to take the opportunity during this first wash to add some deeper colors as well and just start to add a little bit of interest and texture as I start to put down this first wash or first layer. I kind of think about it as in a moving piece, right? So it's not like I do it a first wash and then I'm going to dry it. It's more like I'm doing a first pass in a light, light manner. And then within that light wash, I'm going to darken it as I go. Um, and I'm really judging here based on the wetness of the paper. And so at first, when you first start this um, and you're painting really wet with watercolors, the color is going to move quite a bit around on your paper. It's going to create really soft edges. It's going to expand and it's going to bleed, kind of run around in ways that you can't really control. And at this point is when I tend to keep things really light. So you can see it's a really a barely a wash of color. And this is what I meant earlier when I said I was going to be doing masking fluid over this first wash. So I'm not going to be painting the black parts of the butterfly wings, not until the very end. So if I put masking fluid over the parts of the wings right now, you can see that the wash is so light, it's practically the white of the paper. And even if I darken it a little bit more, it's not so dark that if I put masking fluid on and then remove it, that it's going to look terrible or look like it's not very bright because it's still quite light. Because I'm keeping, I'm trying to keep this, um, this layer as light as possible. But you can see at this point now, I'm starting to already darken certain parts of the background. I want to take advantage of the fact that the background's wet and things are still moving and they can be fuzzy and beautiful, especially because the reference photo here has a lot of that um, effect um, from the camera that creates that blurry background. And that's such a beautiful thing to try and capture with watercolors. And it's almost the perfect medium to try and capture that blurriness that you can have things fade out of focus in the back and then you can have really detailed, sharp, crisp um, items in the front that stand out from the background. And so that's really what I'm trying to capture here. And I'm just using the reference photo for reference right now. I'm not really following it exactly. I can see that parts of the reference photo have maybe some warmer areas in the background, spots of pink, maybe spots of yellow or coral color. And I'm going to just insert those uh, really loosely, as you can see. And I'm starting to move my brush around in a really loose way because I wanna capture some of that brassy feeling in the background. So even though it's fuzzy, and things are moving around and they're not going to be really refined. I still am intentionally keeping my brush strokes um, very kind of moving in the same direction that I see in the background, if that makes sense. So if there are stems of plants and they're kind of going vertically and they're feeling wild and um, I, I will move my brush the same way instead of painting horizontally, for example. So that's just something that I tend to do. You can see I'm also taking the opportunity while the paper is wet right now to do a little bit of lifting with a towel to recapture some of the whiter spots in the background or the lighter spots in the background. Of course, because everything's wet, it's go going to sort of disappear. So the water, the paint, everything's going to move and re-encroach on that space. But it's important for me to kind of preserve some of that white. So I'm blotting as I go. Another thing that's happening right now is as I paint, the paper and the water is starting to dry. And as the paper and the paint and the water starts to dry, the paint spreads less. So you can already see some of the strokes that I'm making aren't spreading quite as dynamically as they were before. And so that gives me an opportunity to start to add details. So you can see everything like is kind of working in one fluid uh, timeline. It's not like there's a very specific start and stop here. I'm just working with the timing on the paper. So as the paper starts to dry, I know I can start to add some of the more harder, quote unquote, harder edge details. Because um, they're not really hard, they're still fuzzy. As you can see, when I put in the 
the strokes, they're still blooming and spreading out. And I do want that soft look and I love it. And so I want to capture the opportunity when I can um, to put those in. So this is also a great time, like you're seeing lifting um, either with a brush or with a paper towel to recapture some of those lightest areas. So I'm trying to make sure the butterfly wings stay rather you know, light, uh, light as possible so I can put masking fluid over and it doesn't get um, kind of covered up with green, for example, because I didn't block off the butterfly wings from the background. They're sort of, you know, all one surface right now. Everything is wet together. So it's really easy for, you know, the green to bleed into the butterfly wings if I'm not careful. So along the same vein of, you know, adding in these harder, like they're still fuzzy, but they're, the paint isn't qu moving quite as um, much, right? Because the paper's starting to dry. I can start to add in some more saturated colors and know that they won't bleed into each other. So this is just a timing thing. It's just me starting for myself in my own journey. I'm starting to understand better and better the timing of it, um, working on this paper, um, in my environment. So of course things are going to be different depending on where you're at. If the humidity is really high or low, your paper is just going to dry at different rates depending on the day. And I'm starting to get for myself a little bit more used to how do I test this? How do I figure out when's a good time to come in? And I don't always know. Sometimes I put down a drop of paint and then realize it was too early and that I had to wait a little bit and then I'll come back to it. So it's not, um, there's no hard and fast rules. And I can't give you the exact answer of when these things can be done, but it's definitely over time a feeling that I've gotten and I never get it right every single time. Like right now when I'm doing this pink flower, I just realized that it was too soon. So the paint is just, it's blooming more than I wanted it to. So then I have to stop. I'm going to do the leaves and then I'm going to come back. I think the leaves were even too wet. And so I'm just you know, working with it, testing. Every single time I paint, it's not like I know exactly what to do. I'm still figuring it out. I say this often to um, the members of my community that, you know, I'm still figuring out things every time I paint. I learn new things every single time I paint, um, whether or not it's about my supplies, about a technique, about my own personal approach and how I might do it differently next time. So I think that's what happens to us every single time we paint right? Every single person paints it. Every time you paint, you learn something and you're going to take away something from it. So I always say that the process is, um, teaches you so much more and it's not really about the final product. Here, what I'm doing is, um, I think you might've just seen, I dried the paper a little bit and now I can come in and do the hard, harder edge details. So the paper's not completely bone dry, but it's dry to a point where I can add in details and the paint's not gonna uh, go out and do its own thing. For the most part, it's staying where I want it to, but it's not like the paper is completely dry. It's just dry enough. So this is really where I'm putting in those final details for this section of the drawing, or maybe they won't be the quite the final, but it's very close to final for me.
All right, so at this point is when I'm going to be adding the masking fluid. So you can see that the first layer is still there. It's kind of got a tint of green in some areas and maybe is a little bit more well protected and closer to a white in other areas, but really it doesn't matter to me because all I wanted was it not was for it not to be the stark white of the paper. And I think that that's, you know, I've done this enough times where I feel like I did the masking fluid right at the front and then I didn't like how white it was. And so this time I just decided to try something new. So I'm using a rubber tipped tool called a color shaper. It's linked below, but it helps me not ruin my brushes and it just happens to work well for little dots and dabs like this scenario. It doesn't work well for everything, I would have to say. So if you're trying to get masking fluid sort of in a brush stroke type of motion or that sort of um, shape or feel with your masking fluid, like something that requires a brush, like a leaf or something like that, it's much better to use a um, an actual brush to apply the masking fluid. But for something like this, a little the little uh, rubber tip really works well for these kinds of dots. Okay, so now that the masking fluid has dried, I'm going to be applying that final layer uh, for the butterfly. So it includes the black parts of the butterfly, uh, the legs, and then anything else that I think I need to finish the painting. So because there's masking fluid, it's really easy for me to just paint over those spots and then know that the little white dots will appear once I remove it later. So that's the great thing about masking fluid. So you don't have to worry about protecting any of the white spots that you're trying to keep at this point. And they're so small and fine for this butterfly that it was really necessary. Um, another way you could do this is if you don't have masking fluid is you could always come back with a white pen or white acrylic paint or gouache paint and then come back on here and then um, just dot those in after the fact. So just paint everything the, the black um, that you want. I'm not actually using black. It's a dark, dark brown mixed with a little bit of gray. So sepia mixed with gray. Um, I don't actually have black in my palette as a fun fact. Um, and I actually made a mistake here. I thought I was going to be making a mistake with this leg. It just, you could see me scrubbing it out. It felt weird. Like the, it, I think it's still weird. I think it's not the right length. Um, it should be longer. I just don't know why the placement got away from me. And I think the previous me, when I first started watercoloring, would probably, you know, not freak out, but just think, oh, I, I just ruined it. It looks weird and maybe fuss with it more. But I know better now. And so I just moved on. I like, tried scrubbing it out a little bit. And I just thought to myself, let me just try and finish the butterfly. And this leg is not going to ruin the whole painting, I hope. And... um and I just, I'll come back and do it later. So you'll see me just darken it. It sort of pretty much lands in the same spot. And I don't think it's quite anatomically, um, is that the word that you use for an insect? I don't know. But um, it's not quite right, but it's okay. I think there are a lot of things that we have to learn to let go of when we paint and make art, especially because we're the only ones that really are our own worst critics, right? We can see the reference photo. We know what we intended to do. We know where it feels off. And I think other people tend to give us more grace. Um, the people that are viewing our work tend to give us more grace than we give ourselves. So I've learned to give myself a little bit more grace. Um, of course, this is not the perfect painting. I don't think any of my paintings will ever be perfect. Um, there's always going to be room for improvement and things I could have done better. But that's the fun, really, in painting. Every single time I learn something new, it makes me excited to try something different next time. I find little pockets of things that I've done that make me feel like, oh, that was nice. I think I want to try that again. Or that was a nice touch. Or what would it be like to explore that in another painting or the next time I try X, Y, or Z? I think those are the thoughts that um, should encourage all of us, you know, as we paint, not looking at the final and then concentrating on things like 
that leg should not have been there or that <laughs> that leg really should have moved. Um, there are parts of this that I look at that I wish I had done better. The the leaves on the stem, the flower itself, I feel I could have done better. I could have done better. Um, but I think if I dwell on those things and I can't walk away with the things that I really learned or the things that I love about it or the things that I'm going to move forward with, I just get stuck looking at the things that I should have done better, but it doesn't really teach me anything or make me excited about moving forward unless I can look at what I did and think, okay, that didn't turn out right. This is what I would do different next time. And then just move forward with an attitude of, um, you know, I can do it. I can try it again or I can experiment. And I think that's really important to remember when we're creating art and we're learning and we're trying to figure out how we want to represent something visually with a very specific medium. You know what I mean? All right, so I did a final dry. You can see that the paper is really starting to dry now because the edges are beginning to curl. So the whole paper is really starting to dry out. And now I am taking the opportunity to kind of saturate the colors more. It's so funny because the filming of this really washed out a lot of the pastel colors. Um, it's a little bit more vibrant in real life, but um, I did feel like it needed even more vibrancy, so I added some more concentrated saturation of the orange into the wings, um, and I can do this and continue to sort of soften the edges and work with it almost as if it's um, just going on it with a dry, like, like it's a dry piece of paper because it's pretty much almost dry and I just dried the surface. So the last thing I did here was um, add a little bit more detail to the background. So you can see because the paper is almost dry, I can actually re-wet the background and then treat it like a wet on wet layer again. And that's something that I forgot to, I could do or didn't know I could do when I was painting early on, but you can do that. And here is um, removing the final masking fluid um, pieces. And so I can reveal what's underneath. You can see that it still stayed quite white, um, but it's not the stark white of the paper. As always, I hope that my sharing, my process, has been a little bit helpful or given you some insight into how you might approach this if you needed it. And I guess I will see you in the next video.